welcome everybody to the, uh, the, the culminating event of our year long um, celebration of women's suffrage, uh, the, the 100th anniversary. And I'd like to start by, um, by just saying that we, Pat sent an email a little while ago from Brian Boyles, who's the executive director of Mass Humanities. I, I would like to share a little bit of that with you right now. Uh, Brian said, um, I just want to extend my congrats and admiration uh, for you and all the people who helped make your work happen this year. It has certainly been a rough one, but we've been applauding Brockton Library and pointing to you, to your inclusion and persistence as the very best the humanities has to offer. And I read that and I thought, well, this is who we are and this is what we do. This is what the Brockton Public Library is. And this is what the Brockton Public Library does. We don't just do it with people who pull a paycheck, you know. We we we've, we we use those people, but we draw from from our from our community as well, from Pat, um, from Mayor Sullivan, who's who's tirelessly given us his time every Friday to do a, a children's story time. Um, we've had we this 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 committee was formed with. Uh, a teacher at Brockton High, Willie Wilson, uh, a professor at UMass Boston, Amina Pilgrim, and Pat, who's who's been a been, been a wonderful servant for us up in the uh, in, in the makerspace, and of course Jen and myself and Catherine, who, who joined us from from the uh, southeastern STEM. That's the way we work. That's who we are. That's what we do, and it's not just the people in this community in this group. We've done it across the entire library. It's 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 Thomas and Kevin putting together interesting programs and, and, and author talks. It's Melise doing all of her ESL programming online this year. It's Sue putting together programming and interesting programming in children's, taking all of children's and moving into an online environment this year. It's been a really rough year, but the Brockton Public Library has been on the vanguard of moving from the, the, the in-person to the digital this year. And that's something to really be proud of writ large, you know, and you take that a step back and, you know, a lot of you who know me, you know, I travel at, at 30,000 feet all the time, you know, step back and you look at that and how we've interacted with the city on this new level in this new, in this year and how we've incorporated partnerships with the council on aging, with the city hall, with the mayor's office, with the, the veterans affairs, with the library foundation and how we've been able to, to, to maneuver in this new environment and really create something meaningful for our for our for our, our our people in the city of Brockton, you know. Step that back even further, and look at what public libraries have done in, this, in the United States and, and and where we come from. Public libraries in this country are unique. When they were founded back in the in in the early parts of this in this country, they were founded to be free access to information. Now, if you think about that, that's a revolutionary concept. And, and the people who thought of that back in the day, in, they, they, put in, they put in place boards to protect the library from the whim of government. You know, think about how many countries you know, growing up, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, you know, um, uh, Soviet Russia, you know, information was illegal. In, 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 in Iran, music was illegal. But here we've offered free information to our people, to our paid, to our citizens. That's incredible. And and now I'm, I'm way out here now. I'll, I'll pull back a little bit, and 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 to this group and and what we've done in this in this in this year over women's suffrage. I mean, we have really drilled down into the history of women's suffrage. We've looked at it from multiple angles. Um, we've, we've 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 created links to other aspects of American history. It's been a fantastic ride, and, and I, I can't thank this committee enough. I can't thank you enough for, for doing this. I can't thank the library and the volunteers who have helped enough. I can't, help, I can't thank the, the people who have participated in the panel discussions. There's too many of you for me to name. I think Pat's gonna, gonna jump in and do that a little bit later. But, but man, this has been a great experience for me. We've learned a lot, and we've added to our tool bag. We are going to continue doing these things in the future. We will continue to, even when we get back to normal, we will continue to do these things so that we can draw in people from, from West Texas and from, from Virginia and from wherever they're coming in. 
Um, I, I look forward to the. I look forward to hearing tonight, but I look forward to continuing this kind of dialogue in in in, in the years to come. So thank you very much, everybody, and um, uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Pat, and uh, uh, and we'll get on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, okay. So we have some welcoming remarks from the mayor of the city. Hi, this is Brockton Mayor Robert Sullivan, and it truly is my honor and privilege to uh, speak to you today about my thoughts on the 19th Amendment, uh, woman's right to vote. Again, we, we had a centennial 100 years ago, right? The centennial uh, suffrage um, was uh, discussed all year long through the Brockton Public Library. I want to thank the director of the Brockton Public Library, Paul Engel, and the staff. I want to thank Brockton Community Access for filming it. It started in January, and we were there, and this was pre-COVID, and uh, it was a wonderful event. We had, uh, you know, voting activists there and members of the NAACP helping us, and uh, uh, former Mayor Linda Balzardi, first uh, woman mayor in the history of, uh, of the city of Brockton, and uh, Dr. Willie Wilson, uh, and, and people from the Brockton Historical Society, and, and Pat Monteith, and I remember uh, Phyllis Ellis was dressed up, president of the Brockton NAACP, and, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the whole year, um, although it's been changed because of COVID, it's been more a uh, Zoom and online. But uh, the statement is, is clear. The 19th Amendment is historic. It always has been historic. And uh, as a dad of, of a daughter, uh, I'm just truly touched to that. Brockton Public Library and so many people were engaged in the, uh, in the, uh, the centennial uh, uh, study this year. You know, I mean, 1920, if you think back 100 years ago, they were going through uh, a pandemic as well. So, you know, um, time has shifted in 100 years. And this year, in the year 2020, of course, Kamala Harris, uh, first woman and woman of color elected uh, to vice president. She's the vice president-elect of the United States of America. And that really is historic in its own right. So, you know, we can look back in time to see, you know, other um, famous women. Um, here in Brockton, uh, I think the 19th Amendment, what it means to me is it allowed uh, women to participate in democracy. The, uh, the art of voting is your right, your say, you know, your vote matters. And uh, I just, I, I, I applaud everybody that participated uh, in this celebration, this uh, centennial celebration. Uh, even though it was a different year because of the uh, pandemic and the health crisis, uh, everybody stayed the course in the educational uh, that helped the next generation uh, was wonderful from the movies to the videos to the display. If you went into the Brockton Public Library's main library, the wonderful display and, and the pins that were giving out historic women and, and the such suffrage movement uh, itself is just amazing. So uh, as the son of a history teacher, my dad, uh, Bob Sullivan, uh, was a Brockton High history teacher from 1970 to 2001. Uh, so as a son of a history teacher, you know, I, I just love history and history in America and abroad. But when you look at the suffrage movement and you look at the 19th Amendment as a lawyer, I'm just so proud that it's on the books and 100 years has passed. But, you know, it, it, it just it's as meaningful today as it was uh, in 1920. So, again, I applaud everybody that participated. I applaud everybody that were, was engaged to learn more about it. Right. Um, to learn. Uh, is in essence the, the way that we become a stronger community. So uh, again, thank you for doing what you do, Brockton Public Library. Thank you for all the wonderful volunteers and the historians and the educators and the community activists and people that are just Brocktonians because we are the city of champions. And everybody involved in the Brockton Public Library centennial celebration is a champion in your own right. So again, it is my honor and privilege to be the mayor of Brockton. I truly uh, thank you for your time, your efforts, and uh, stay safe, be well, and I'll talk to you soon. God bless. Jen, what have you done yep. here? So hi, everybody. I don't know if you can see this real quick. It's just a setup of what we did. Um, a shout out to Sue McCormick for helping me um, create these giant posts um, on the size of pillars that are on either side of our cutouts. Um, it was a great time. And she also created those um, big giant versions of our pins are on the wall too. So we had a good time um, hanging this all up and getting it ready for our opening day. Thank you, Jen. Um, one of the things that we did, one of the first things that we created was a Facebook page. And thanks to Jen for her help on helping to, uh, on maintaining this. And uh, you can see what it looks like. Uh, we invite you, we'll put the link to the um, Facebook page in the chat so you can link to it if you'd like to if you don't know 
what it looks like. Um, that's it on the left. One of the things, and I want to thank Evelyn for this, we were chatting before we started, and she had mentioned how she had missed some of the events. And I told her that we have several videos um, on our Facebook page that she could access and be able to look at some of the events that she may have missed in the past. So um, if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see um, a couple of special pages on the left that says all videos, all photos, and you'll be able to um, see what we've done in the past and what we might continue to do, at least in the near future. Um, right now, what I'd like to do is uh, give a little uh, shout out to Brockton Cable, Brockton Community Access Cable, uh, who's recorded eight of our different events and they're, they've put it on their YouTube channel. Now, I happen to know that Carol Copeland Thomas um, has got to leave in a few minutes. And so um, we thought we would let her have some conversation about a panel that she moderated about bias. Um, but let me introduce Catherine Honey, um, who uh, will tell you about Chris and Carol and some of the things that we've done that she's helped us build. Catherine? Um, good evening. I'm uh, Catherine Honey. I'm the uh, Southeast Mass M Network Coordinator and uh, have been amazed at what the planning committee has done. And in my role, I work uh, with organizations like the library to promote science, technology, engineering, and math um, education. Um, I did ask Chris uh, to be my voice tonight. And so she's going to introduce Carol and Chris, please um, ignore my thoughts because I'd like you to get right to Carol because okay. she's going to have another commitment. Yes, I know. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm happy to introduce Carol. Um, Carol and I are both members of the Taunton area branch of AAUW American Association of University Women. And I've had the opportunity to participate in many of the programs uh, that Catherine and Pat and Jen and everyone uh, at the Brockton Public Library has, has planned and offered this year. One panel discussion was the one that Carol is going to talk about. It was called Bias, Personal Institutional Systemic. And that was in September. It's my pleasure to introduce Carol, the panel moderator for that discussion. Carol, as I said, is an AUW member and founder of the Multicultural Symposium Series. And Carol, here you go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chris. Chris is very modest. Chris is the president of our branch of AAUW and does a, a, just a yeoman's job. So thank you very much, Catherine. Honey, I can't say enough nice things about you and the job that you're doing with AAUW, but also with STEM. And Pat is now a Zoom par excellence, uh, just officioso, officiano. So thank you very much for moderating and uh, very glad to hear from the Brockton Public School, uh, Brockton Library Director and also the mayor of Brockton. I'm going to speak rather quickly, and fortunately, some of our panelists are actually here in this presentation, in this meeting, so they'll be able to fill in the gaps. I have another meeting that's going to start very shortly. We did talk about bias. Our panel primarily focused on bias, not just from a macro perspective, but they really broke it down very well, talking about the personal impact of bias, the institutional impact and also the systemic impact. Why? Because we all function on different levels as we relate to, as we make decisions about bias, as we are impacted by bias. The thing is, we're all biased. And I'm sure that you probably have heard of programs and training programs now called unconscious bias because of how we react to different people or situations we all know about what happened with George Floyd back in the spring, who was unfortunately uh, killed by the police in Minneapolis, and the reaction that happened uh, after that point in time, and the reaction now in terms of Black Lives Matter, symboli uh, symbolically so, representing those who want to be valued in our society. But when you look at bias, the panel 
talked about it from an individual level, the personal level, and then bumped it up and talked about how we are impacted by bias from an institutional pr- uh, perspective. We're talking U.S. at this point, obviously bias impacts different parts of the world, but we were pretty much talking about what takes place on the U.S. basis and then how it just gets systemized and um, systematized from an infrastructure perspective, making it very difficult to separate, um, allowing for uh, a free-flowing, equitable perspective when people are going to work or when they're interacting in their neighborhoods or their communities. So with that said, we started off, I may have my order wrong, but we did start off with that generic conversation. And then Lynn Howard, who is the president of Delta Kappa Gamma, Massachusetts, she's also a fourth grade teacher, um, talked about it and looked at even how, from a personal point of view, it impacts girls. As you all probably know, Catherine's program, STEM, that takes place around uh, the country, ultimately is trying to empower our girls, making them more valuable, understanding their own value from young girls who are in grade school or middle school and certainly up to high school and beyond. And Lynn put a perspective on there about uh, its impact uh, from what she sees as a teacher and how she sees it um, in other places, other ways also. Pat, who is our MC tonight, is a coordinator with the Brockton Public Library Suffragette Centennial Project, which we are all a part of. And um, her emphasis was um, on, again, the personal perspective. And I believe that she brought in some conversation points about COVID, how we're all being impacted by COVID, the coronavirus. We see now in terms of, uh, fortunately, a vaccine that is being produced and you know, who's going to get it first and how is that going to be prioritized? And even that can be looked at from a perspective of bias. But Pat also shared her thoughts from a personal perspective. We then moved on and talked about institutional bias, again, how it gets framed and um, how people are impacted, uh, certainly the achievement of underrepresented groups in the workplace uh, and, and other aspects of it. And how, uh, from a systemic point of view, how bias, discriminatory practices, et cetera, can definitely impact us. So we had Keith Connors, who is the Massachusetts, uh, he's from the Massachusetts Department of Higher Education. He's a program manager there. And again, talked about the equity agenda, which is supported by the Higher Education Innovative Fund. Uh, Also, 100 Males to College and the Massachusetts STEMS Network uh, with an effort to ensure equitable services for all students in all communities. Looking also from an institutional perspective, we had Dr. Sabrina uh, Gentlewater, Warrior. She is the Vice President and Division of Student Success at Bridgewater State University. Uh, They are spending uh, quite a bit of time looking at this uh, race bias, global diversity, et cetera. So she talked about it from the perspective of what is going on at the university and other aspects of um, an institutional approach to bias. And then we moved on and talked about systemic bias and our very own, again, the president of the AAUW Taunton branch, uh, Chris uh, Jimian, talked about AAUW and how AAUW started how it obviously is um, built and works and designs to empower women academically, professionally, and um, the reasons why STEM empowerment issues can be combated in an institutional and a systemic way when you have organizations like AAUW. Uh, We then moved on, and um, again, I'm looking at my notes and want to make sure I don't forget anybody. I have Dr. Amina Pilgrim, who is the senior lecturer uh, for gender studies at um, UMass Boston, and again, looked at you move from institutional to systemic and how that then gets played out in our societies and in our organizations. So she also talked about it from a woman's perspective. And then Dr. Willie Wilson, who was here with us, and I'm sure he can explain a little bit more so, again, added his perspective in terms of the systemization of bias. Uh, I also brought up uh, authors like Dr. Um, 
uh, Robin D'Angelo, who wrote the book White Fragility. And she talks extensively about going from just a personal level of bias and how that then gets chucked up and moved up in terms of a systematic way where it becomes institutionalized in our society. And uh, Dr. Willie Wilson talked about um, the impact of it. I think the highlight for all of us was listening to a young uh, 15-year-old sophomore in high school and the poem that she has written. Her name is Melody Rivas. And I'm going to just read just a little bit of her poem before I have to dash off. And she has entitled it, What About Me? And she says, the war was not won in 1920, yet there were still white women aplenty, dropping their signs, leaving the streets, raising their voices to hoop with glee, drowning out the frantic color cries of what about me? The war was not won in 1930. Many women were still left yearning to vote right next to their fair-skinned peers to get what they had been denied for years. Their voices were silenced. Their ballots were empty, but they did not stop in 1920 or 30. And the poem goes on from there. I'm sure that Pat will uh, give you access to it. We'll put the information again in the chat room. But again, we have that kind of talent. And I think the great thing about this panel is that we looked at it not just from an adult perspective, from a systemic perspective, but we even included a 15-year-old who gave a powerful close to our, po our panel on bias. Thank I want to make sure, did I, did I catch everybody? I didn't want to leave out any of our panelists. No, I think you caught everybody. Um, and we will actually be seeing um, Melody uh, recite her poem in a few minutes. That's a teaser, an appetizer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, All right. So let me go. Carol, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, take and care. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, okay, so we are back here. And let me hide the floating panel. And that was Carol. Now you can see the entire presentation um, of the bias presentation, as well as some of these others um, on the uh, Brockton Community Access YouTube channel. Um, and I think Jenna's gonna put the link to that um, into the chat box. Um, so the rest of the presentation that we have tonight actually goes in chronological order. Um, I think if I can get my PowerPoint to work properly. Why isn't that moving? All right, let me stop sharing and then go back into it. I'm sorry, I don't know why that happened. Um, Okay, there we go. Uh, so I did put the link in the chat for the Brockton Community Access for everybody. Great, thank you so much, Jen. All right, so um, we started our events on January 29th, and uh, Jen, you want to talk about what you did here, uh, setting up for our kickoff event? Um, sure, we set up some nice tables. Um, we have a collection of um, books and videos that the patrons were able to check out. Um, and then on one of the tables, we had flyers um, and brochures talking about the different books and videos that we offer for patrons and to check out, um, along with our sponsors' um, brochures and information. We also had a kids' coloring table um, for them. If we did have children, I think we had one or two, which was nice. Um, that came with the color to give them something to do in case they get bored of hearing all the adults talk. Um, and then we had a nice little display of um, vintage looking things that Pat, I believe, found um, from the British um, side of the pond on their suffrage movement down that lower uh, right hand corner. Um, we had to make your own pin um, set up, a nice little different pages. I had the people, I helped them make their own pins. And then on our far left, we had um, our setup for our Black Suffragist event with Phyllis. And um, I think our panel for that coming up, the, which was February, which we were able to get in before 
COVID shut us down. We also had voter registration table, which was fantastic. We had someone there too. We had our um, Mass 100 Women's was there. Um, we had a great representation from all community members and sponsors that were there that night. All right, so one of the other things that we had that night is we had a brochure um, that ended up going in the lobby of the library in addition to being there that night. And I want to say thank you to Thomas Ahern, who's on the video tonight, I can see, um, who put together this uh, list, a book list of uh, the women's suffrage uh, books that are available at the Brockton Library. Um, and there's both adult, children, and young adult book lists here. Um, if you would like a copy of this, please send us an email at bpl.suffrage at gmail.com, and we'll be happy to send you a copy, an electronic copy of this brochure. And I'm sure once the library is open again, we'll have uh, this brochure available in the lobby. And thanks again to Thomas for doing a great job of putting this together. So then we had our very first kickoff event. Um, and this was so far uh, in excess of anything I had ever hoped would happen for this. And I think the committee probably shares in this as well. Um, the kickoff event was called One Vote Matters. And one of the reasons for that is because um, my mother was actually involved in a situation where one vote mattered. Um, she was too tired to vote after work one day. And the person she wanted to win lost by one vote, um, something that as a 14 year old, I never forgot. Um, but then we also had Linda Belzotti, um, who was the former mayor. And when she ran for a second term, she lost by just a couple of votes. And then uh, her pictures in the bottom right hand corner with uh, Senator Mike Brady. Uh, right above that, uh, the tall woman in the middle is um, Cheryl Crawford from Mass Vote. Um, who talked about several different um, situations where she knows where one vote did make a big difference. So thanks to everybody. Um, we had not only uh, the mayor was there and um, a couple of our uh, state representatives and city council members, um, but it was a wonderful evening and uh, we're very, very thrilled. We had about 50 people show up that night and it was a great, great, great event. Um, right shortly after that, we uh, set up a couple of back-to-back -back exhibits in the library display cases, um, one on black suffragists that um, uh, Greg Hazelwood, who's a social studies teacher at Brockton High School, helped put together with some of his students, um, in addition to uh, Courtney Henderson, who you're going to hear from in a minute about uh, the black suffragist uh, events that she put together. And then um, Catherine Honey, along with, uh, I believe Paula Jones came back in, who had already retired from the library, but she came in to help put together um, and a display of Blanche Ames Ames um, from Borderland and other women in STEM. Um, Courtney, if you could jump in. Courtney's uh, the... Um, chair of the WIN committee, women in NAACP, um, the Brockton area branch NAACP, and uh, Courtney helped put, put together two absolutely amazing, amazing events that we had at Brockton High School um, that was packed for two class periods in a row, 150 students each for students to learn about black suffrage. Um, you wanna jump in here, Courtney? Absolutely. Thank you, Pat. One I want to say, um, I couldn't have pulled this together without you, Pat. You definitely were someone that handled the majority of all of this. Um, I also want to thank Kimberly Zuzwa, who was also a panelist at this event, as well as Dr. Amina Pilgrim. Uh, they were very uh, intelligent and knowledgeable on the subject matter. We talked about the Black suffragists and their their impact during the whole uh, lead to the 19th Amendment. 
we spoke on Ida B. Wells, who was actually a graduate from my alma mater, Fisk University, so I'm a little biased when I speak on her. Um, we've talked about Harriet Tubman, and then we also talked about the Black women groups and organizations that helped lead, uh, who helped led to the, the movement. Um, Kimberly Zuzwa, who was a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, her sorority was also played a huge part in that movement, as well as the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Unfortunately, my sorority was not in existence at the time, so we weren't able to help with that, but uh, all, all love towards them. Um, we also talked about the differences between the suffragettes and the suffragettes that um, I had no idea. So that was something that I definitely learned from. It was a great, uh, a great event. And the, the students asked really great, great questions. I was really impressed by the questions that they had. You could definitely tell that they were engaged. Lovely event. Thank you, Courtney. You know, and one of the things that we did with both this and the other event that Courtney put together is we focused on um, African-American black suffragists and facts not typically known. You know, people like uh, Mary McLeod Bethune and Elizabeth Piper Ensley. And as Courtney was just mentioning also about the importance of the Delta Sigma, Sigma Theta sorority, which was founded at Howard University and was the only African-American women's organization to participate in the 1913 March. Um, Courtney put together this other event two days after the event at the high school. And uh, this was an extremely uh, special event that um, we had some amazing people who participated on the panel. Courtney? Absolutely, I can speak on that one. Um, thank you to, I don't know if they're on here, but thank you to uh, Marita Rivero, uh, Charlene Green, and Dr. Paula Austin. They were great. Um, this one was more in depth just because the audience was a little bit older. Um, we spoke again on the, um, the women that led up to, from the beginning, from the antebellum period, all the way up to the 20th century. We spoke on Phyllis Wheatley. We spoke on, um, again, Ida B. Wells, just the whole group of wonderful women that helped lead, uh, lead us into the 19th Amendment. We spoke, um, Charlene Green actually spoke on the gr women's groups that, you know, helped with the movement. She also taught me something that I was not aware of is that during the March um, on Washington, Delta Sigma Theta was actually asked to march in the back of the line because they were African Americans. So what's really interesting to remember is that even though black and white women were working towards the right to vote, there were still some inequalities that the black women faced, though they were fighting for the same, the same right. So that was definitely very interesting uh, to learn. And then I also learned that, um, her name is escaping me, but one of the black women were, uh, was the first oratorical uh, speaker to talk to a mixed crowd of both black and white uh, individuals. And I think we also spoke a lot on the, the women leaders straight from our own state, Massachusetts, and those in the neighboring states of uh, Rhode Island and New York. Um, I feel like this event was so far away that I'm like, I'm losing some of the um, great topics that we've, we've touched on. Um, but I do believe that this was recorded like, like Pat mentioned. So if you ever wanna go back in and hear the great things that we've talked about, I would definitely recommend watching that. Right, this is available on the Facebook page um, and you'll be able to watch it there. I don't think, I'm not sure whether or not uh, Roxton Cable recorded this one or not. Um, so moving right along, as I said, we're, we're doing this in chronological um, order. Um, we're still into the non-COVID phase of the project, which is why you see people in the auditorium down in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, but then this next event was just absolutely amazing. And it's something we partnered with the Brockton NAACP with and uh, our own Phyllis Ellis, Ellis, president of the Brockton NAACP, a living history, Sojourner Truth. Phyllis, you wanna 
give us an idea of why you decided to do this? Because you asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was actually very happy to be a part of the uh, 100th anniversary of the uh, women's su suffrage movement. It was, um, this program was well put together throughout the whole, everything. Pat, you did an amazing job and everyone else. So I congratulate you on that. And so my role in this was to um, tell the story of Sojourner Truth and also to recite her poem, Ain't I a Woman, <laughs> which I love to do. I actually got into character to do that. Sojourner Truth is actually one of my heroes. You know, she's well, she's like dominant, you know. She made her presence known, not because of her height, but because of her views about the world. Seemed like she knew where women would stand in years to come. And that has um, proven to be just, you know, the 19th Amendment, that was the right thing to do, giving women the right to vote because women have stood up more than anyone else when it comes to voting. We put people in office like no other, like this year with Kamala Harris. So um, Sojourner Truth was a, um, a women's rights activist. She had all these kids, but my when I got into character to recite her poem, Ain't I a Woman, I kind of felt like I was her. <laughs> because of, of the, what the poem was about. So Pat, I enjoyed doing it. I'm glad you made me do it. So, <laughs> and ask me again sometimes. To betray her. I, I don't think okay. I made you do it. I think you actually suggested <laughs> it. No, actually, I, I enjoyed doing it. It was great. Yeah, it's, I've seen uh, Phyllis do um, Ain't I a Woman a couple of times, and she is very much in character when she does it. And she just did an absolutely incredible job with this. Um, so shortly after that, um, we were invited, um, Paul Engel, the director, and myself were invited um, to the State House to participate in an event there that Mass Humanities was holding. And we were really um, stunned. I was making a few comments like I typically do, um, but we were very stunned that um, Senator Mike Brady and Representative Jerry Cassidy were there. Um, I had invited them, it doesn't mean that you know, they were going to have time, but they both showed up and presented Paul and I with um, a citation that um, was just very sweet of them to do that. So one of the other things that we did um, starting the end of February was um, we put together a suffrage movie series. And this is something that um, Jen has handled completely. And Jen, you want to talk a little bit about why these movies were chosen? Um, well, most of them, to be honest, I didn't choose, um, Paula did, <laughs> and I okay. just went with it, but they still turned to be, turned out to be really, um, inspiring and energetic and informative, uh, movies. Um, the one that really I've talked to before to Pat and the people that really stuck out with me was that Perfect 36. Um, and that one, it dawned on me, um, a light bulb went off, I suppose you could say that we're taught little snippets of different histories, um, but we don't always put them together. And in this movie, we were talking about the 19th Amendment, but also um, the anti-suffragists in Kentucky, I believe, yes, was using prohibition to for their cause um, to go against the suffragists. And in my mind, those two things didn't overlap um, because I'm taught one set of things and another set of things. And, um, I've always loved history, but to me, it was with Lily Ball. Oh my gosh, these things do over. And so you you get a wider sense of what history is about when you have these all these elements come together, and it becomes more real if you only know one thing. But then more real when everybody else comes into the party. Um, the reclaiming their voices was something I stumbled upon myself actually on um, the Indigenous Native American of um, Arizona, which was fascinating. Um, that one we found on Vimeo, I think it was. You can't, we didn't get it on Hoopla or Canopy, excuse me. Um, the only ones you cannot see on Canopy, which is a service we provide to the library, is the Life and Times of Blanche Ames Ames and then the Reclaiming the Voices. But all the other ones and many more are on our Canopy devices. Um, I was absolutely thrilled when we saw the Borderland movie again. Um, I was actually at the premiere at Stonehill College right before COVID. Um, and we were very fortunate to get both the director and the writer of the movie to join us. And 
we couldn't, I think we filmed the after part, Pat, um, when they talked, I believe right. we did. Mm -hmm. um, but the movie itself, we couldn't film because obviously the, the copyright issues. But if you ever get a chance to see that movie, I highly recommend it. I can't wait for it to come on video. Um, yeah. But everything, every, every movie we had was inspiring and very educational. And I was very lucky that I could uh, participate and help in running that. Right. Thank you, Jen. Um, so the next event that we did, which we had expected to do several of, um, and it's actually the last event that we were able to hold before um, the coronavirus hit, um, was, as Paul uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, I run the makerspace at the library. Um, and we had a suffrage activity. And so we had the kids actually um, making the rosettes and pop up our yellow roses, um, which is part of um, women who are in support of suffrage, and as well as making a lot of the um, pins of the different suffragists. So the students were um, in there making all the stuff during one of our makerspace activities, and uh, turned out to be really, really great. But then, as I just alluded to, COVID hit, um, and here it is, the beginning of March. We had you know, dozens more activities that planned. Um, and I got that call one day from Paul that said, we're shutting down the library and um, we're not gonna be holding anything else in the library for the foreseeable future. So we put this um, slide up um, on our Facebook page, on the library's Facebook page um, and said, you know, we, I immediately heard back from a lot of the planning committee members who said, we got to find a way to continue this. Um, and so we said, you know, check back in a little while. We'll tell you what we're able to do and when we're able to do it. Um, and so the very first event, um, it took us about a month to get things together. And the very first event that we were able to decide to hold was on Zoom. And that was on May 7th. And uh, we decided to call the series the first Thursday conversation series. We figured the first Thursday of every month, uh, we would bring in somebody to talk on Zoom about the suffrage movement. And um, Willie, as I've known him to jump into everything, um, <laughs> decided to uh, that he was going to be the first facilitator. This was our first attempt at a Zoom event. So we didn't quite run it the way, you know, we ended up learning the best way to run Zoom. Um, but it was still a very, very healthy conversation. Um, and do you have a couple of words you want to say about this, Willie? I know you kind of jump in on a few others, but anything? Um, well, this one, uh, this was our very first, uh, and, and I was learning Zoom at the time, but it, we, we started with uh, the program at the high school. Uh, first, we identified uh, about 15 or 20 um, black suffragists. Then we went to um, about 53, and then we went to about 150. And then uh, uh, I got involved with uh, Alexander Street uh, Research Company in Vir Virginia, and uh, and and we uh, currently are at uh, 400 400 black suffragists that have been identified, and the research is just going on and on, but. Uh, uh, the stories are so engaging, and uh, and on this May seventh uh, evening, I just highlighted a few, and uh, but the stories are, are really uh, grappling, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the Black suffragists in general. Great, thank you, Willie. Um, then our next event, we had intended on doing something, doing a lot more with the high school. We were going to get. Um, Mr. Greg Hazelwood's um, students to come in uh, to the library and show off these um, different folders that they created. And Greg, you wanna talk a little bit about um, what these folders were all about? Are you there, Greg? I am, okay. I am, I am. Something was wrong with my screen. Um, just quickly, uh, appreciate, I mean, it was just the total collaboration 
Um, I know the students and definitely myself appreciate to be involved with the event, but starting with Willie, giving me a list, adding on to the list and starting off with um, so many different voices um, that the students actually learned about that were local and then also some newer names just to kind of show that spectrum and the idea of being inclusive and adding so, um, so much. And I think, and it was unfortunate because there was so, there's going to be a lot of post activity too before um, COVID as far as them, as far as reflection, but it was just such a great opportunity. We were trying to figure it out and Willie had great ideas for bookmarks, but um, I usually do something with historical heads anyway with them. And this was a perfect opportunity to actually do that. And um Thanks to, I mean, and all the events just coincided so well. Um, I know Dr. Pilgrim's there, a shout out to Dr. Pilgrim and UPAT coming down to the school and Courtney setting that up for the students. Um, so it, it was just, it was, it was great overall because I think it's a nice template to show how it is a total community event. And um, Stephanie Landerholm, our department head, is just so good as far as go for it, do it. And it was a great assessment for the students and so much that they, um, I learned from it and so much that they learned too. Yeah, this, this project was incredible. And, you know, we we're really sad that we weren't able to actually bring the students in so they could talk with, you know, attendees um, throughout, you know, that, that evening that we had originally planned. But we really appreciate that you came in and shared all this with uh, those on the Zoom event. Not a problem. I know there was um, one, I think there was a student that actually shared. So I had to find that old copy of what they actually wrote, but it was, a, I know more of them wanted to show up on the day of, but unfortunately. Yeah, that's right. Um, anyway, so as the planning committee was talking about the different things we we're going to do, um, we hadn't initially planned on um, a contest of any type. Um, but I remember calling Lexi David at the um, Barbara Lee Family Foundation saying, so would this sort of fit in with how we can spend the money if we were offering prizes to the students? And she said, well, it has to do with the suffrage movement, doesn't it? And I said, yeah. And so we figured that it would be something that, was, that we could um, spend the money on. So I appreciate that, Lexi. Thank you. And so we decided um, to hold an art and poetry contest for students. Um, we only had middle school, as it turns out, we only had middle school and high school students participate. Um, but um, Amina, I know you were um, putting together, you were reviewing the um, submissions. And I don't know if you wanna jump in with a few words about um, the quality of the submissions for the contest. Sure, thank you. Um, well, I have to say, as I said in the chat, congratulations to the whole committee for this amazing year and this amazing journey. And it was an honor and a privilege to help out with this contest and um, to read the creativity and the insights and the inspiration that the young people displayed in their writings and in their artwork. Um, so I, I, I really uh, noted that many of them showed an understanding of the larger significance of that moment and how maybe it has infected, uh, in, affected their own lives today. Um, we heard a little bit about that when we heard about um, Melody Beavis's poem earlier and I still have one of the portraits of Sojourner Truth on my wall right now, um, which I was able to convince uh, one of the winners to make a print of for me. And the, the contest just was another display of the talent that we have in our city and the intelligence of the students and of the impact of this series um, on the young people who were obviously inspired enough to create the poetry and the art that they did. So thank you. Thank you, Amina. So um, I know that, that Willie was very taken with um, Melody's poem, which um, Carol read a little bit about before. 
um, both Melody and the other first, the first place art winner. Hi, my name is Melody Rivas. I go to Brockton High School. I am a sophomore. The title of my poem is What About Me? The war was not won in 1920, yet there were still white women aplenty, dropping their signs, leaving the streets, raising their voices to whoop with glee, drowning out the frantic colored cries of, what about me? The war was not won in 1930. Many women were left still yearning to vote right next to their fair skinned peers to get what they had been denied for years. Their voices were silenced, their ballots were empty, but they did not stop in 1920. The war was not won in 1950, but there was no time to waste on pity. American women from all shades of life, natives, Hispanics, and Blacks alike, never stopped making and painting their steins, never stopped fighting to gain voting rights. And when met with a pale opposing crowd, they raised their voices twice as loud. Nothing would stop them, not even their fear. They continued their fight right up to the year of 1965, when a fateful rally was planned to march the highway from Selma to a piece of Montgomery land. Though their protest was peaceful, bloody Sunday still did raise and by state troopers meant to protect, they were beaten, gassed and tased. But despite the attacks, the protesters would not be scared away. They continued their highway march to span all of three days. Through this injustice, they fought back and they were paid off with the Voting Rights Act. The war was won in August of 1965, when colored women across the nation were able to set down their signs, when they stepped off the streets and to the polling place formed lines, when they stood together and said, the right to vote is mine. Thank you. Hmm. So the um, first place art winner is uh, Stephanie Amanzi, a 10th grader from Brockton High School. And she's going to show you the piece that um, she ended up uh, giving a copy of to Amina and telling you why. Hi, I'm Stephanie Amanze. I'm a rising sophomore at Brockton High. And this is what I did for my art entry. My piece is a rendition of the famous abolitionist and woman suffragist Sojourner Truth's portrait. I used alcohol markers, colored pencils, a Sharpie, white gel pens, and Pigma Micron pens as my medium on a 12 by 12 sheet of mixed media paper. I chose to draw Sojourner Truth as my entry because she is one of the most renowned and well-known women suffragists in the 19th, 19th century America and was at the head of my two favorite social justice movements in, America, in American history, the abolitionist movement and the women's rights movement. Sojourner's silhouette is outlined in red with white strips going through it because the color red often symbolizes courage and strength, two virtues truth was known for. And the white stripes were added because white represents equality and truth not only fought for the equality of black people, but also for the equality of for women as well. The women's suffrage movement is identified with the colors violet, white, and gold. So I drew those going through Sojourner Truth. The abolitionist movement's logo is a black slave in handcuffs with the phrase, am I not a man and a brother, written on a banner underneath the slave. To incorporate her involvement with the abolitionist movement and give it a twist of femininity as well, I changed the phrase by altering the male pronouns to female pronouns, am I not a woman and a sister. This allowed me to show the alliance between these two movements and how truth was the mediator. In the white space of my drawing, I decided to write the most famous speech Sojourner gave in her career as an activist, the Ain't I a Woman speech she gave in 1851 at the Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. This was very influential in the women's suffrage movement as it showed how the movement was failing black women at the time and only catering to white women. She signified this by asking the question and Ain't I a Woman many times in her speech. On the border of my piece, I wrote the years that had significant events in a Sojourner's life that I felt needed to be included. In 1797, she was born. In 1826, she finally escaped slavery after being sold four times. In 1843, she changed her name from Isabel Bonfrey to Sojourner Truth. In 1846, she officially joins the abolitionist movement. In 1850, she was one of the many famous attendees at the first 
Women's Suffrage Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. In 1851, she gives her an anti-woman speech. In 1867, she creates a program to help ex-slaves. And lastly, in 1886, 1883, she dies in Michigan at 86 years old. Finally, I colored the border with royal blue because blue signifies legacy. Sojourner Truth left a royal legacy that exemplifies the progress of women and Black Americans today. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. I think Stephanie is probably on the call right now. We'll talk to her maybe in a little. Stephanie, actually, do you have anything that you want to add to that? Are you on? No, she's not, is she? Okay, Stephanie said she was going to join us. Um, all right, let me go back to sharing the screen in a minute. Um, one thing I realized as I was, uh, when we had stopped last time, um, I had some of the transitions set up to play automatically and as a result of that uh, that's why we just had those two things jump in the way they did but let me see if I can go back to this and have it right okay so um, uh, the beginning of July uh, we had a last minute issue where uh, I can't remember who was going to be doing the program, couldn't do it. And we were very, very fortunate to have Katrina huff um, who's a, a Randolph Town Council member and vice president of Suffrage 100 Massachusetts come in and lead that conversation. And as I was just looking at the screen, I don't see Katrina here, but um, it was a conversation about um, women suffragists um, and everything that she learned as being part of Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. Um, on July 22nd, um, we were really pleased to have uh, Lisa Kathleen Grady, um, who's a curator at the Smithsonian Institute. She put together the whole suffrage um, exhibit there at the Smithsonian. And after she finished two weeks later, um, the Smithsonian closed down because of the coronavirus. Um, it's supposed to be uh, up, I think, through the end of this of uh, next summer. Um, I don't know. Is is Lisa Kathleen on the call right now? Let me zoom. I can't see who's on when I'm running the PowerPoint. So no, I don't see her. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jen. Um, but it was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Uh, there were items that she showed us from the exhibit, um, the woman's suffrage wagon, um, the exhibit they did from the National Women's Conference in 1977, Susan B. Anthony Shaw, um, Mandy Helen Burroughs, um, a pin that she had. Um, but there are a lot of things that she shared with us and uh, got us really excited, got a lot of people excited about being able to at some point go down and see the uh, suffrage exhibit at the Smithsonian. Um, about a week or two after that, um, we were, uh, Leona Martin from the Brockton NAACP was connecting with getting books to the summer program um, at, uh, in, in Brockton. And so we dipped into the budget and decided to purchase 35 books about suffrage women to donate to a special program that they had for middle school girls. And uh, the books that we decided to buy is The Bold and Brave, 10 Heroes Who Won Women the Right to Vote. And it was a picture book from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand um, who shared stories of 10 suffragists. Um, it's a great book and uh, the kids were able to take this home and keep it. And so hopefully we've had a really good influence on them. Um, August 6th, uh, the first ever viewing of an 18 minute movie of a reenactment of the suffrage meeting at the Ames Mansion in Easton, Mass, which happened on January 13th, 1915. Um, the movie was edited by um, Ezra 
Werb and Laura Lee Baer, um, and was followed by a discussion about Blanche Ames, Ames with the play's movie writer and director, Olivia Pierce, who just graduated from um, Oliver Ames High School in Easton. And she's now, I think, down at the University of Texas as a freshman. And we also had uh, Paul Clifford, uh, the Borderland Park Ranger. And um, we'll let uh, Chris Ajemian maybe give us uh, some information about um, this event and this movie, which was absolutely incredible. This is, by the way, this is one of the movies that is available um, on the, the uh, Brockton Cable uh, YouTube channel. Chris? Yes. Um, I was also, it was also my pleasure to be a part of the, uh, uh, the Borderland Suffrage Planning Committee. We were, we worked on this project for well over a year. Um, I think Pat and Jen, you were also involved, and of course, Catherine and Susan, Suzanne Bump, um, and I hope I'm not leaving anybody else out that was involved there. Uh, and the idea was for the first to plan a, um, uh, an in-person uh, reenactment of the meeting that Blanche Ames uh, held on January 13th in 1915 during a snowstorm. Uh, she called uh, the meeting and invited women from Massachusetts suffragists to come and plan how to win the vote in Massachusetts. So um, uh, Olivia uh, and with uh, I think with uh, a couple of other friends from Oliver Ames High School wrote a play and we were going to enact it. They, they were going to enact the whole thing um, but of course then COVID hit and that threw our plans out the window. But we managed to find an, another way. And with the help as Pat mentioned of that um, video team um, with, um, let me get their names straight with uh, uh, Laura Barr and Ezra Werb and with the help of Paul Clifford who supervises the uh, visitors. Uh, he's visitor supervisor at Borderland. Uh, they were able to put this together and, and really happy that, um, that it was finally pulled off. And, uh, the participants included in this video included Pat Monteith, Jen Belcher, and Paula Jones, the staff of, of the uh, Brockton Public Library. It was a great project, and uh, um, we were so happy that it, you know, we were so disappointed that we couldn't do it in person, but we finally got it on video. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chris. It was, it was an interesting event, and I hadn't done any acting since I was <laughs> in middle school. So it was a very interesting experience for me, yes. let me put it that way. <sighs> yes. All right. Um, so, um, oops. The, uh, one of the things that happened in, um, Jen, if you wanna talk about this a little, oh. Oh, sure. Um, the um, American uh, Library Association had reached out to all public libraries um, looking for anybody that wanted to have donations from them. Um, there were, I believe there were two children's books and two adult books that were sent to um, every library that participated. Um, that actual, that middle one, official National Park Service handbook, uh, is extremely fascinating. Um, I wish they sold it in a regular store that I could borrow that I want because I wanted to keep it. I took it home. I just didn't want to bring it back. But um, if you get a chance to check that out, um, it's a great little read. And then around the American to win the vote, um, the kids' books are adorable. Um, and we are very fortunate and thankful to the um, ALA to um, let us participate in getting the free books. Thanks, Jim. Um, okay, so the next event we had was on, actually we had three different events on August 26th. Um, this was the first one. And uh, Chris, I think I'm gonna bring it back to you so you can um, help us uh, learn what this project was about, this event was about, which was just absolutely amazing. Um, this was uh, protecting the right to vote in a digital democracy, the impact of cyber attacks on voting and technology on civic engagement. And along with me, the moderator of this panel um, was also a member of the Borderland Suffrage Planning Committee. It's my pleasure to introduce Suzanne Bump, who will talk about the, the, uh, the panel. And Suzanne is a member of the Easton Shoveltown Cultural District, District Committee, and she is our Massachusetts State Auditor. Suzanne. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, this really has been a, a, a joy this year 
uh, Catherine Hunting got me involved uh, in the borderland activities. I had already been engaged uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the background in the development of the Life and Times of Blanche Ames, Ames movie that was produced. And I'm glad that, uh, that it got such a positive review in the remarks that were made a little uh, while ago. It, uh, I had the pleasure of also being in attendance at, that, uh, at the uh, premiere and, uh, and moderating the discussion with the director and the, uh, the, the writer um, and was very disappointed that, uh, that it didn't get a wider um, physical audience uh, during the past year. Um, but I was pleased to participate in this, uh, in this really good panel uh, that uh, looked at how we are uh, protecting, preserving uh, this right to, uh, to vote that we so uh, cherish. Uh, you saw quickly uh, some of the participants, uh, the names of the participants in the panel um, let me just review them for you because we uh, it started off with our Mayor Robert Sullivan. Um, he uh, talked in a you know, very substantive way about the way that the city was uh, ensuring uh, voting access, uh, particularly during this, the COVID uh, pandemic at a time of, uh, of great political uh, distress uh, that we've all been feeling during the, the past year. Um, the the uh, and it, the results really are are, uh, are evident in the of, of his efforts are evident in the numbers. Uh, there were um, eleven thousand mail-in votes uh, in the city of Brockton in the presidential election, uh, as well as uh, as eight uh, or nine thousand um, uh, votes that were cast in early in early voting. And he talked about the security um, that the, uh, that was being put in place. Uh, to ensure that those votes uh, would be collected and, uh, and counted. Um, and Brockton had a tremendous uh, turnout there and we appreciated the effort that he was describing that the city was making to um, make ballot access uh, easy, the kind of information that was going out um, uh, through the city's website and, and other means. And then we had two folks. Uh, uh, Stephanie um, Helm is the uh, the uh, Massachusetts Cyber Center Director at the Massachusetts Technology Collaborative. And then there was also Stephen Trochet, uh, an assistant professor of cybersecurity at Bristol Community College. And they talked about the kinds of uh, typical attacks um, that are, are uh, common um, in the internet, uh, the, you know, the uh, phon phenomenon of phishing and of ransomware, as well as um, hacking. And uh, they were really actually ultimately very reassuring uh, to us because Massachusetts and, uh, and increasingly now other states are uh, depending upon uh, paper ballots. Uh, con uh, uh, voting machines are not um, being connected to the internet and so therefore are not uh, susceptible to the kind of hacking that we were very concerned, have been concerned about over the past few years. Um, rather, the kind of cyber threat uh, that really had, uh, had prevailed and were, uh, that most experts were most concerned about can, comes in the form of disinformation on social media. Uh, we're learning now in the aftermath of the uh, presidential election uh, that uh, there have been folks who for the past number of years, uh, actually since 2016, I uh, had been uh, working to identify and to break up uh, the attacks that were coming in from, uh, from not just uh, foreign sources, but also some uh, domestic groups. Uh, it didn't clearly, it didn't prevent all of the disinformation, which unfortunately continues to emanate from a number of domestic sources uh, relative to, uh, to the uh, results of, of voting um, and the uh, security of the, of, of the ballot uh, all across the, uh, the country. Um, but it is, uh, it's, it's something that had been very much on the minds of folks in the federal government as well as at the state level. And we're hearing now, uh, thankfully, that uh, this was the most secure election uh, that, uh, that has taken place in this country. Um, we, had, we talked um, also with Andrea 
um, McLaughlin, who's the youth program manager for the for Mass Hire uh, and the Greater New Bedford Workforce Board, uh, we talked about youth engagement um, across kind of across the board. Uh, workforce is one of her priorities, but also civic uh, engagement and the and and just it, it just underscored the importance of um, you know protecting uh, the public from disinformation uh, across social media platforms, uh, young people being, uh, you know, potentially particularly susceptible to it because of the uh, in, in, in enormous amount of time uh, that they spend on those social media platforms. Um, so it was a really interesting uh, conversation uh, and, and much of what the experts predicted really has, um, has played out, uh, but it was, uh, it was good to hear from them, the extent to which our government is uh, a partner with the public in protecting access to the ballot and the uh, and the uh, correct tallying of votes being cast. Thank you so much, Suzanne. We appreciate that uh, overview. All right. So um, as I mentioned, we had um, two other events that same night. Um, I'm not sure I'll ever do that again, <laughs> but um, oops. here we go again. Why? All right. And um, one of the things that we had, uh, August 26th was the actual signing of the 19th Amendment back in um, 1920. Um, so there was a big movement um, forward into the light campaign. Um, that was sponsored by the um, National uh, Suffrage 100 Committee. And so we decided to do our own uh, event here in Brockton, have our own conversations. We had a wonderful conversation. Um, we had um, a few of our city councilors do a great presentation. Each of the uh, contest winners uh, presented their poem and artwork, um, and it was a wonderful event. Um, we, uh, the information about our event was picked up on Purple and Gold, which was the national site that was put together by um, National Suffrage 100. Um, we had 497 people watch our event that night. And as you can see, 7,000 people were actually talking about our event. Um, that night, uh, we were also presented with a, a, a citation from uh, Mayor Sullivan, uh, the Brockton Library Suffrage Centennial Committee uh, received the citation for the effort that we had put together. We also um, took part, as I said, in the Forward Into Light campaign where we lit up City Hall in purple and gold. Um, and the uh, Brockton Enterprise did, uh, oh, I think seven or eight different photos, photo spread um, of City Hall. And this is what it looked like that night and um, it was just pretty spectacular. Uh, we uh, sent in our photo and they included our photo, um, the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, along with all the other um, city, uh, all the other buildings across the country that were lit up. And these were all the, the um, buildings that were lit up in Massachusetts. And I think that we stand out pretty well um, in to that event. Um, we received a display from the National Archives and uh, Jen negotiated this whole thing, Jen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I just kind of stumbled across this email that um, was put out. Um, we actually ended up entering for it twice. So that's why you see this too. We have one that is, I believe still set up in our um, Lingo's Auditorium at the library, um, which people can still come into as of now to use the computer. So you can visit one there. And then we had the other one go over to City Hall, um, which they were nice to put out in the hallway, um, along with another display that we will talk about in a second too. But yeah, we got two, so it was great. I was a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked, uh, Carol talked a little while ago at the beginning about uh, this presentation that was done um, on bias. I don't know if there's anybody else that participated um, in that event that wants to make any other comments about this? 
Chris, do you have anything else to say about it or Lynn? No, I think uh, Carol was pretty thorough. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, then as Jen had mentioned before, um, we were talking with Kevin Friend, who's the producer and uh, uh, I don't think he wrote it, but he's the producer of this Borderland, the Life and Times of Blanche Ames movie. And um, he was generous enough to show the movie um, for as part of our event. Um, and then he came along as well as the writer and narrator of the movie, Kate Kleiss, and had a, a great conversation about um, what they found in their research. Um, we were actually kind of surprised at some of the things they found and some of the things they didn't find um, about Blanche Ames Ames and um, just the, uh, her life and everything else that came with it. Um, so we really appreciated his time and effort in uh, participating with us on that. Um, Jen, this is the other exhibit that um, you were involved with. Um, if you um, take a look in the bottom left-hand corner, that big uh, travel case, Jen calls me one day from her office and says, Pat, there's this big, heavy case. I'm not going to open it till you get here. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was pretty substantial. It's about the size of me, and I'm like five three, five four. Um, so it was a good size um, luggage case. So um, in the middle picture there, you can see um, my coworker Sue McC uh, McCormick um, checking them out after they were set up, so we could see how beautiful they were. Um, I really wish. I hope a lot of you got to come and see them. Um, we had three set up at a time at the White Ave entrance at the Brockton Public Library, so you could come in and browse and see it, and three other over at the City Hall, right in the same hallway as the American Bar um, display was um, set up in like a triangle type formation. Um, we were ecstatic to, in the middle, the next picture is Paul Engel, myself, and Sharon from Texas came and saw us and um, we were able to give her a tour um, when she was there at the library and it was great that she could show up and come visit us. And then the last panel, uh, last picture is the setup at uh, City Hall. Um, we were able actually to have this for all the whole month of October. Um, it was a traveling exhibit um, sent out by the American Bar Association and um, most libraries or museums who got it only got it for about one or two weeks. Um, and we were able to negotiate to get it for a whole month. So we were very honored and happy to um, be able to present that and have it available for our community. Thank you, Jen. All right, then um, in October, the beginning of October, um, we brought in the cast of uh, We Did It For You, A Woman's Journey Through History. And they did a special uh, version of that for us on women's suffrage and women, women um, vote. Um, we do not uh, have any other photos from this event um, and they did it as a webinar rather than as a meeting so that's why you don't see a whole bunch of people but we know that there were 60 people that participated that night and watched and asked questions. It was an absolutely tremendous play um, and if any of you have had a chance to see it you know exactly what I'm talking about. A few weeks later, as part of our STEM initiative, our Governor Baker's STEM Week initiative, um, we did a couple of different things. Um, Jen and Sue put together a couple of videos of how to create the suffrage pins, the rosettes. Um, and actually, Jen did the pin, right, Jen? And then Sue did the uh, yellow rose pop-up card. Um, yep, everything was filmed in your room in the makerspace. <laughs> yep. Um, and that yeah. was actually um, bundled with uh, a piece on, a video piece on um, voting technology through the ages. Do you have anything else to add to that, Jen? Nope, um, just that if anybody's interested and you're in the area, you're, um, you can come and get one at the library, um, both either craft both, whatever you want. Um, and there's the instructional videos are still on, and probably will be there on our Facebook page. All right. So you can get a free kit of either one of those or both of them if you'd like. And uh, especially if you've got kids in the family, 
But even if you don't, it's still fun. Well, to and to 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 on that same note, my sister is runs my niece's Girl Scout um, troop, and she wanted me to give her a kit, and she took the kit and modified it for her little ones. So instead of actually using the ribbon, she was able to do like colored paper with um, with just glue, and she was able to do it um, herself. So if you want to take the kit and just tweak it for yourself. Or Sharon, I liked your idea of making it a, st a firework. That would have been good too. <laughs> Sharon, do you want to put in any two cents about um, building the rosette? Is uh, it difficult? No, just read the directions. That's all I can say. <laughs> Pat, Pat, yeah. I need to run on. I'm hosting my book club meeting in two minutes, so I'm afraid I'm not going to get to see the wrap up. I just wanted to thank you and Jen and for your hospitality, for this wonderful series. I've just thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you do anything that, anything, just please let me know and let me in on it, so. We will. Um, make sure you come back and watch the rest of this afterwards because, oh, okay. um, you know, we've, we've got the uh, unveiling of the um, interpretive signs. signs. Right, I know. And you know, you you gave me those uh, printouts, which I have with me right now. So I'm um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll mute myself. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Okay. Thank Hi, you, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Shoshana, are you still with us? I know she had to go off because she had an event with her daughter. No, I guess not. Um, so the end of October, the participation of immigrant women in the 20th century U.S. suffrage movement and Shoshana Ehrlich, who's a professor at UMass Boston, um, gave a wonderful presentation um, and lots of information as well. Um, then uh, in November, uh, we had made a commitment to do another display later on in the year, which we were doing here. So we've got a display of um, suffrage books that people can check out of the library that's uh, displayed in the auditorium as well as a display of the poems and the art winners um, in frames, really nicely put together for, you know, the kids to come and see if they wanted to. Um, and then on November 12th, this was the last event, uh, official event that we held. Um, and uh, we were so glad to be able to get Dr. Allison Lang, who's a professor over at Wentworth Institute of Technology. Um, which is kind of interesting to have somebody who's so into the suffrage movement over at Wentworth um, with all the techies over there. Um, but she says she is having an influence, which is great. Um, she brought for us uh, pictures uh, of images in the women's suffrage movement that I had never seen before, for the most part. Um, she also does displays like this at Harvard University and for other organizations across the country. And it was just a wonderful presentation. Um, the thing that really stuck out at me was the two pictures in the bottom left um, of Inez Milholland in 1913 on her white horse at the parade back then um, and how Brianna Noble rode her horse through downtown Oakland, California, uh, supporting the Black Lives Matter movement um, and how she found that um, a parallel, very interesting. But she had a lot, a lot of photos that, as I said, I had never seen before, which were really amazing. Okay, so now we've gotten to yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and that laughing. bitter, bitter cold. <laughs> and that bitter, bitter cold. And we had, oh, I can't even begin to tell you, um, some of the issues that we had with trying to get the interpretive signs done. We had problems with um, the quotes that we got from the company. We had problems with um, a lot of our uh, writers and text editors for the signs um, nitpicking. Um, <laughs> but in, a but in the way, end, <laughs> in a way, so here it is. Uh, we were told by the sign company that they were going to be there yesterday, sometime between nine 30 and 10 o'clock. And so, you know, I get there at nine 30 and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I decided to go home for a while. And apparently just as I took off, they showed up 
um, had a chance to talk with Paul. Um, and so, you know, Paul texts me, I come back to the library. And just as I'm walking from the parking lot, the truck takes off. <laughs> <laughs> so at 10 o'clock yes, yesterday morning, um, that's what the front of the, li- the side of the library looked like. There was nothing going on there. However, however, uh, at one o'clock, this is what happened. Yesterday at one o'clock, it was cold out. My toes froze. <laughs> I'd never seen anything like this done before, so I had no idea how long it was going to take or what to expect. And there you go. And so by 3.30 yesterday afternoon, much to all our surprise, um, the three suffrage interpretive signs were installed along the white F, white way from the parking lot. So this is Justin on the left, who is from the sign design company, whose wife was due to give birth two days earlier. Um, so I don't know if his son has been born yet. Jen is in the middle looking at one of the signs or actually looking at the hole, I guess, trying to wonder how the hole's gonna get filled. <laughs> So surprising yeah. that didn't fall in it. <laughs> and then on the far right, um, there's Willie and myself and Paul um, in front of the finish signs. And in fact, um, all three uh, were installed. All three are there. Um, and here's what they look like. Um, the first sign um, is, and they're all 18 by 24. Uh, the theme of this first sign is about Brockton and Brockton area suffrage women. Um, and it's got a lot of information that um, thanks to Thomas who helped do some research and concern uh, and uh, confirm some information for both Willie and I on this. Um, we have the, the Brockton women who attended that meeting of Blanche Ames Ames um, on January 13, 1915. There's the women from Brockton who were there. Um, the thing that I found most interesting um, was I found the reference in a couple of places um, that documents that Brockton was the second, if not the first town in Massachusetts to form a local women's suffrage association. And on the bottom left there, you could see the officers who were chosen at that first meeting. The second sign, the theme of the second sign is about black suffragists on in Massachusetts. Um, and Willie did tons of research on it. And as he said, um, you know, for all the information he found, there was more information that he kept finding and there's now over 400 black suffragists that he found information about. Um, below in yellow are the names of Boston area women who were also black suffragists who had a major influence on black suffragists in Massachusetts. And one of the names that really jumped out at me um, because I worked at UMass Boston for a long time um, was Melania Cass. And so I would go down Melania Cass Boulevard all the time and I really knew nothing about her, but I've since learned a lot about her. And then the third sign um, is the one that really took an awful lot of time. And the theme of this third sign is on US diverse women who broke barriers as a result of the 19th amendment passage. Um, the uh, planning committee um, all took a piece in making recommendations on who should be on this sign. Um, and it goes back to um, Jeanette Rankin um, back, uh, who was uh, represented Montana in the House of Representatives um, in, from 1917 to 1919. Um, there are other parts of the country that did allow women to vote earlier than 1920. 
um, and then she served again from 41 to 43 and all the way to modern day. And we've got Kamala Harris in there. Uh, we actually had the copy done, um, but we held the copy until we knew whether or not uh, Kamala Harris would be um, the vice president elect. And then Tammy Duckworth and Ayanna Presley and Rashid Tlaib. Um, this is an incredible an absolutely incredible uh, panel. Um, and I wanna thank Brady Motes for suggesting that we put QR codes there. So each one of these QR codes, you know, we hope the younger kids especially will go up with their um, phone and, you know, have a QR reader and find out more about every single one of these women. Um, it's just amazing, amazing stories. So then, you know, one of the things that um, Willie had pointed out that we all know is that here it is a hundred years later and we haven't forgotten the dedication and the efforts of those women, you know, back in the, you know, in 1920 and um, earlier than that. And there was a calendar that came out this year that all members of our planning committee uh, received a copy of um, the Women's Suffrage Centennial ca calendar. On the back side, um, you know, you can see the New Women's March on Washington from 2018. Some interesting photos from the calendar. And then my favorite, seriously, is the bottom right hand graphic of the stamp that was released by the US Postal Service uh, several months ago. And I actually was able to go to the Randolph Post Office uh, last week and get some more of these stamps. So that's what I've been using for stamps for the last couple of months. I'm um, because I bought a sheet. I was gonna give some to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, a couple of final things. Um, and these are all very, very, very important to me. Um, one is the project impact. And I've got to say, until two days ago, you know, you get involved in things and you hope for the best and you hope that people are participating and you don't necessarily really realize the um, impact until you uh, see the numbers. And these numbers are just staggering. We had 41 events. Um, we had, you know, over 2000 people either live in person or post event video views, um, ah, shoot, um, 16,600 uh, reach on Facebook, um, people in person at the banner displays and um, you know panels and presenters, absolutely amazing. So here's something that the committee does not know about, but we were able to get this video from Senator Elizabeth Warren. I can't believe you got her. <laughs> Voting is the beating heart of our democracy. 100 years ago, the 19th Amendment was ratified, giving women the right to vote. So as we mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, we honor the bold and brilliant women who came before us and made this day possible. Women like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whose names have been etched into American history. But we also mark this day by centering the unsung heroines of the suffrage movement. Black and brown women like Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and the countless women whose names we will never know because they have been erased from history. In the century since some women were given the right to vote, women have made progress towards social, racial, and economic justice today. Women and girls make up nearly 51% of the U.S. population. Women outnumber men in undergraduate education, and they make up nearly half of the U.S. workforce. Women are leading in committee rooms, board rooms, and in the halls of Congress. We have made tremendous strides, but there is still so much more we must do. On average, Women still earn 82 cents for every dollar a man earns. And women of color suffer from an even more severe gap. Black women earn 62 cents for every dollar a white man earns. And Latinas earn just 54 cents on that same dollar. Also, Roe versus Wade established a woman's right to a safe and legal abortion 47 years ago but extremist Republican lawmakers are fighting to turn back the clock 
to outlaw abortion, and to deny people access to reproductive care every single day. And while the 19th Amendment enshrined a woman's right to vote right there in the Constitution, for too many women of color, that right was denied until the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965. And then in 2013, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. And today, as racist voter suppression tactics surge, Mitch McConnell continues to not allow a vote on restoring the Voting Rights Act. So for these and, and for many, many more reasons, the fight for equality must persist. As we mark the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, here's my pitch. Let's use our voices and our votes to elect more women and more women with diverse backgrounds, not just because it is the right thing to do, but because it gives us a better chance to make the right decisions for our families, for our communities, and for our entire nation. So uh, I want to thank my partners in crime on this uh, unbelievable project, um, Jen and Paul, Catherine, Amina, and Willie. We're so fortunate and grateful for their expertise, dedication, creative ideas with this project. We have been honored to have as our humanities scholar and Brockton area historian and teacher extraordinaire, Willie Wilson Jr., as an active and engaged member of our committee. Willie has guided the research that helped us learn about Brockton's place in and oops, uh, people involved in the suffrage movement. Thank you so much, Willie. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you've been amazing. Um, many organizations who have supported the committee and this project since before the project began, writing letters of support, um, coming up with ideas for guests, uh, promoting the project. Um, you know, a lot of people here, a lot of organizations here have been very supportive. Thank you to a lot of individuals. Um, and I know I was a little crazed trying to make sure I had everybody included here, but everyone from folks in the mayor's office to Stephanie at Brockton High School, um, uh, you know, Francesca Damari who did the craft video, State Senator Michael Brady, State Rep Jerry Cassidy, State uh, Rep Claire Cronin, who um, sent her um, uh, comments that um, she called actually her, one of her staff called, said she wasn't feeling well about an hour before this event. Brockton Public Library staff, including Thomas and Sue and several others, uh, Leona and Alexander Street, um, and I hate that this is, keeps jumping, American Bar Association, National Archives, uh, Yu Yi Ling, who was the graphic designer for all those three interpretive signs. Um, our presenters and panelists, um, we've had over 30 uh, presenters and panelists in this project, um, and they were just all absolutely amazing and incredible. And then um, funding from Mass Humanities and Barbara Lee Family Foundation, we were not able to produce anything other than top quality, relevant women's suffrage programming for the centennial without their help. Our deepest gratitude to each of the two organizations. Thank you so very, very much. All right, that's all I have to say. What about the rest of you? <laughs> Um, so, Jen, you want to put back in the, um, uh, I'll do the survey real quick so everybody can, yeah, yeah, survey. So, what, well, let me interrupt before, while Jen is doing that, can we all give a reaction and a hand to Pat Monteith? I remember when you called and invited me to be part of this and uh, it was such an honor and we're all here because of your vision. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, and the city owes you a lot of gratitude, a debt of gratitude for this project and thank you for leading the work. Thank you. Yes, all. second that. Thank you, Pat. Okay. Second Pat. that. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, all I did, I was I was the conductor, you know, everybody else were 
the little parts that were the parts of the orchestra, trust me. Um, um, but you were an exceptional conductor. And I just want to say that uh, being part of a committee has been an exceptional experience. And while I thought I knew about the suffrage movement, um, I learned a great deal and uh, just found the experience very rewarding with working with uh, the committee and all of the panelists who provided outstanding programming. So thank you to Pat, committee, and the panelists, and those who have come to almost every event. Yes, thank you. Without you, we wouldn't have yeah. done this all. And, and I want to say, Pat, the same thing, Pat, because uh, once COVID hit, I really didn't have a vision on how we were going to change. And it really was your leadership and uh, insight that helped us to kind of regroup and change things uh, to the point where we almost had more uh, uh, exhibits and activities after COVID than we did before. And uh, I was a little disheartened after COVID, but Again, you had a vision that really propelled us. And I, I want to say, you know, I, I'm, I was the scholar of the program, but uh, it, it goes without saying, I learned so much. And uh, like I said, going into the, particularly the black suffragists, we had uh, 25, 35, then we went to 53, then we went to 60. And then thanks to the outstanding uh, researchers at Alexander Street, uh, we're over 400, and a lot of the uh, individuals, when you go to Wikipedia, a lot of those entries are done by scholars uh, from Alexander Street, and it will actually mention, if you if you research it, it'll say uh, information from Alexander Street. So it's just been exciting, uh, very, very exciting, and, um, and I'm looking forward to the next phase. Like I said, when the library's fully open, and we can actually delve into the lives of some of those Brockton women who were involved with Blanche Ames mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and do a phase two. We'll, we'll wrap it in, into something into uh, 2021. But again, Pat, outstanding. I learned so much and it was nice meeting people and seeing people that I, that I uh, had met with and done activities with before Evelyn uh, DeLulis and, uh, Deludas and uh, Thomas Ahern when I when I was out of breath and was a couple of times ready to give up he did that re necessary research the gritty stuff and uh, and sent me the emails and attachments and gave me a, a, an injection to go the next mile uh, so everything was just it just was a great opportunity and uh, and I enjoyed it fully I would like to say how much I enjoyed every single presentation. Um, I, too, learned so much um, about our local history, but also our national history of women's suffrage. So thank you so much for the, all that you have done to make these, this project so valuable. Well, I, I'll kick in here. Um, I want to say as a participant, how well you all took care of the participants. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were times when I had to email or, you know, reach out and, and you all reached out to me. And so the, the experience itself, watching on Zoom, I mean, we were all coming at it, um, you know, firsthand, first time for many of us, um, but you made it seamless. And so I could, I could get my headset and I could get my camera and everything ready and sit down. And I learned a lot and I, I got to share and listen to so many different opinions and so much different information, lots of facts and lots of stories. The research was amazing and the, the sharing and the giving of everybody on the screen, <laughs> how else do you say it, <laughs> was just glorious. So I want to say thank you. And 
I really felt well taken care of. You know, there was never a concern. Um, everything went smoothly from my end. So hats off to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there were a couple of times, though, it wasn't quite as seamless as you think it was. <laughs> but the, we, that means we did our job that you didn't see the bumps. <laughs> Um, uh, Lynn, do you have anything to jump in? We haven't heard from you yet tonight. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make it. I had another meeting, but I did uh, get done with that one in time to get here. I wish I could have been to all of the events. It was great tonight to see the recap so that I could see the ones that I had missed. I really enjoyed the ones that I attended and sorry that I had to miss some of them because Every single one was just, you know, just so different and so much information, as other people said. And um, I'm glad some of them are recorded so I can go back and watch them and, um, you know, love to share them with other, other people in the other groups that I'm in. I invited people to go and see the um, We Did It For You. They've been doing some live, you know, some um, uh, presentations on Zoom. So I've had a few other people attend those that I've told them about. And, you know, it's just so many things that you guys did. It's just amazing and wonderful and hope that you'll continue something like this because I think it's such important history that hasn't been told enough. We hear, you know, as somebody growing up in the 60s and 70s, I heard a little bit of, you know, all these women and black suffrages and things like that, but not enough. <laughs> so I'm glad we're telling more of these stories and I hope we continue and share as much as we can. Well, I'll be perfectly honest. When we started this process, um, what, 14 months ago, I think mm -hmm. it was, Maybe it was, it was last, November, it was last fall. Last, yeah, it was November of last year when we had. Oh, actually, it was earlier than that because to apply for the grant, we had to have some ideas and information. Oh. So we probably got together for the first time last September, um, and you know we were only expected to go through the end of October, and then because of COVID and um, some of the issues, I don't want to even begin to get into about those interpretive signs, which turned out to be wonderful. Um, and, I, you know, again, hats off to Willie. Willie did most of the work on those interpretive signs, um, especially the second and third one. Um, I can't wait to see them in person. They look amazing. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. Um, but, yeah, it was, what a year it's been. I can't, I, I can't even explain. I've never been involved in a project like this where so many people um, have really had so many different pieces, parts of it, and it just came together, sometimes seamlessly. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think it was one of those programs, there was something for everybody, you know, there was just so many different things that you offered and so many different presentations, it was great. <laughs> yeah, we had wanted to do more for youth, and we had one of the things that ended up getting canceled was we had, we were going to have a nice tea for the, the uh, seniors over at the senior center across the street. Um, the high schoolers. We were going to try to get intergen intergenerational oh, nice. um, yeah. meet up to go. We have a question, Pat, Yeah. Um, from Kim. How did you decide what information to include in the signs? <laughs> Willie, <laughs> take it away. Well, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah. Well, first of all, the first, the, I had a little bit to do with this, the first sign, but whoever came up, I... I, I love the first sign and that kind of uh, mode that was the, the local women in Blanche Ames and that was really the impetus. The second sign uh, in terms of African American women, I, I decided to focus on uh, uh, because I couldn't there there are black Brocktonians, women who were involved in the suffragist movement, but I couldn't do the necessary research because the library, uh, because of, of, of COVID. So what I did is I selected, I selected all the, uh, I, we looked at the 400, uh, the 400 odd black suffragists nationally. And then I focused on those from Massachusetts. So the, I, we, I settled on um, five individuals who were profiled, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, uh, M Mariah Louise Baldwin, Elizabeth Carter Brooks, uh, Elizabeth Piper Inslee, and Florida Ruffin Ridley. So those are the five that we were that we profiled. But then in yellow, 
Uh, we have uh, Mania, uh, Melnia Cass, Francis Ellen Watt, Watkins Hopper, Victoria Earl Matthews, Meta Vo Warwick Fuller, Pauline Hopkins, uh, Nancy Gardner Prince, who was the very, very first black suffragist from uh, the early 1800s. Uh, interesting life. All these women have powerful, powerful uh, personal stories and testimonies. Uh, uh, we have Eliza uh, Ann Gardner, Addie Waits Hunton, Sarah Prince, Angela Weld Grimke, uh, Helene Johnson, Mary Church Terrell, who comes up quite often, Charlotte Fortin Grimke, uh, Lois Malou Jones, and Dorothy West. And, uh, and, and those people in yellow, it says, below are names of Boston area women who were also black suffragists or who had a major influence on black suffragists in Massachusetts. And I have to say, I am honored and touched because Dorothy West, who was uh, one of the youngest members of the Harlem Renaissance and lived uh, in, uh, on Martha's Vineyard in Oak Bluffs. And I had the opportunity of meeting her and, and taking my students uh, to visit her on the vineyard. And, uh, and, uh, and so there was a personal connection. But that's, that, was the, that was the second, that was the second panel. And uh, the, I, I have, the stories are so powerful. Some of the, it, it will move you to tears. And the evening that I did, uh, I shared with, uh, uh, on, uh, with some of uh, the individuals from the national scene, the stories are just riveting, just powerful, what some of these women had to go through and, and, and what they achieved. So uh, uh, that, was the, that was the first one. Then the, the last one, there were so many every committee member had to we had to keep going and and reducing the numbers and it was just it was really really tough yeah uh, i had i had everybody give what five names i think five names yep and, names. and we put that into a big list and then we just started narrowing it down it's like okay so out of these you can pick three <laughs> it was a process it was well we had such a huge list that we had narrowed it down to a certain amount but then all the information and then the QR codes we wanted to fit on that sign wouldn't fit. So then we had to whittle it down again. <laughs> so it was just- and, and, the, and the sign design, oh, she was fabulous. Well, the way she, because once we had, once we made our final decision, um, you know, then with the print copy, and I think people are gonna just be blown away when they see them. They're beautiful. They're beautiful signs. They're, They're beautiful, beautiful signs. Oh, what a testimony to a lot of work by a lot of people. But I, I'll tell you, this has been an exciting project. Um, definitely, definitely rewarding. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thomas, uh, again, I want to give a heads up. Thank you, thank you, because you didn't realize, but there were times when I was ready to throw in the towel on some. It was so difficult, and then you had you would do that necessary gritty stuff and send it. And then I said, "Oh, I, I can't give up," you know. And it was really, uh, you know, because it, you know, anybody that does research knows there are times you just, you know, even my own family said, "What are you doing now? Suffer just, suffer just." You know? They were teasing me, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, but it's been worth it. Is there an archive of all of that research? Um, yeah, Thomas. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, do you have something you want to say, Thomas? Yeah. Thomas. No, just, uh, you know, you're very. Everyone's very welcome for the, mm -hmm. you know, the research and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you're an honorary committee member. member. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you did a couple of brochures. Not only that one about, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the book list in the library, but I think you did another two as well. Mm -hmm. um, which I was trying to find at at some point my files are not as organized as I may have appeared to show them tonight. To me. <laughs> well, the Almost. presentation the presentation was was excellent, and what a surprise to have those words from uh, Senator Warren. And I think it was just apt. Everything she said was right on, right on. Yeah, I was I was keeping that as a special surprise for everybody tonight. The, once in a while. Through the committee, I like to make sure that the committee gets a surprise. And, uh, yeah, Senator Warren's comments are rich. <laughs> Janet, do you have uh, any anything you'd like to 
jump in. I mean, you were, Jada was there yesterday um, doing the three hours of the cold with Pat. <laughs> no, she was only out there for about an hour and a half. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> My toes were frozen. That's all. Jada, <laughs> you're um, muted. You have to unmute. Oh, there it, you it was <laughs> glorious to see those plaques suddenly appear so beautifully and uh, it's going to be a legacy for for Brockton for many many years so thank you all yeah so um the the, the information that's in those signs right now are going to be up through the springtime um we are looking for additional funding because we were originally going to have six or seven signs out there um, and as Willie alluded to, we have a lot more information that we found um, and had to really think about what we were doing once we realized we only had enough money in the budget for three signs. Um, mm -hmm. I love the way they themed out. You know, one of the themes is just on Brockton and Brockton area women, um, the black suffragists from Massachusetts, and then um, the, collaborate, the collaborative effort to determine who was going to be on that third sign, you know, people who, you know, broke the glass ceiling um, as a result of the 19th Amendment. We would not be where we are today. We would not have a, you know. And, and, and what, what I like about the last sign, and we had to hold it up because we were waiting to see if, uh, if Kamala Harris was going to actually be vice president elect. And one of the things she said after she won, she said, and I, you know, I may be the first, but I am telling you, I won't be the last. And I, I thought of her and that sign, and it, it's just, it's absolutely true. <laughs> well, I was really impressed that she talked about the suffrage movement, you know, um, in her speech that night. It was so fitting and wearing the white outfit and everything else. So I know it. I, I was, me too. Me too. It was really, really appropriate. Yep. Yeah. Any final comments? I just want to say that I think the research that you've done on the on the uh, black suffragists really could be fodder for graduate thesis, PhD research papers, biographies. Well, that, I'm I'm thinking those lines. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm thinking I'm really uh I, you know I had told Pat I you know after all the work and uh, mm -hmm. you know I said oh I I just you know I'm actually considering. Um, a book. Um, a book. Oh, that'd be fabulous. Yeah, that'd be great. Wonderful. And I could say on the high school front, definitely, even if we could not do an official field trip, they, I have seniors, they're going to, it's going to definitely be an assignment. Maybe, I mean, there's so many ideas that I was just thinking about, especially with the technology and the bars codes, but actually them doing the research, going up, maybe doing something where it could be a video where they actually talk about um, mm -hmm. what they've learned, but definitely using that as um, probably something for them individually, not until, until things really change, but definitely a space for them. And, uh, mm -hmm. and you have, and I definitely have something to talk about and share with them tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, great, Greg. Great. Oh, yeah, definitely. That, that, that's what's important, truly, the young people. Okay. Yeah. That's how we keep it going. Yeah. That's definitely yeah. how we keep it going. Yeah, yeah. Melody's poem and and um, uh, Stephanie's uh, artwork are two mm. pieces of uh, that have come out of this that are outstanding and will and I'll never forget that poem. That's yeah, in the, all in the, the poem. Yes, absolutely. Truth, of Sojourner Truth. It's just fantastic. <clears throat> Wonderful. Yeah, she uh, she had too much homework tonight. She really wanted to attend, but um, um, it was it was she said. I can't. <laughs> One more thing. And then Stephanie said she was going to. I don't know what happened to her. Oh, well. Because um, usually what she says she's going to do something. She mm -hmm. participates. Something must have come up. Pat, know. we have um, two other participants. I don't know if they've been with us before. Kim and then uh, BM. Does either of these participants like to have a comment or a say well, or anything? Kim had asked the question. Yeah, Kim asked the question. Yeah. Yep. Uh, just. Yeah. I want to give them a chance. I know some of us can talk forever. <laughs> really? <laughs> I said it nicely. You should see when Willie and I get together sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, we've had long conversations. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. But yeah, this, I mean, I can't tell you how incredible um, this project has been for me um, and the folks that I worked with seriously. Um, the five of them have just been so incredible to work with. Um, I haven't had to push or cajole or threaten or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been a labor of love for every single one of us. And Catherine has you, brought so you, much uh, to the table. But you modeled the work ethic too. You modeled the work ethic. Hey, that's what happens when you're retired. You have a lot of free time on your <laughs> always models the work ethic. <laughs> yes, actually. I, I've been a firm believer in that for years. It's not anything my staff could ever accuse me of not doing, but, you know, modeling the effort. And, and Catherine, as I started to say, you just, you know, what you brought to the table, the individuals you brought um, into the different panels were just incredible. And then you did all the follow-up. It was wonderful. I didn't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's part of it. You know, it's one thing to have an idea. It's another thing to have an idea and then follow through mm -hmm. um, to make sure that idea happens. I was just going to say, too, uh, on the editing, you know, because after a while, uh, you know, and, and Catherine, you were able to zoom in, you and Jen, on uh, some things that went by Pat and I because I was just too close to it. <laughs> that was good. Yeah. Well, I, um, the overall program has been inspiring. Uh, one, because we showed, um, shown a light on people some of us did not know existed, and they were inspiring. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, too, working with the committee and all the panelists and all the attendees, um, they were committed to this program and their energy, I think, inspired all of us. And so I just want to thank everyone for their part. Um, and please that this will be on your Facebook page so that others can see all of the inspiring work that uh, you all have done. So thank you. It's been thank a great you. project. Yeah, I would, um, I want to give a special thanks. Um, and Paul, if you could pass this along to the mayor. Um, the mayor has been so unbelievably supportive on so many different levels. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, you know, from recording the messages that he did um, to making sure that he found time in his calendar. Um, all the, the first three events we did at the library, he was at every single one of them. You know, he spoke at every single one of them. You know, I, that, I, have, I, have been, um, I have been thanking him all along, and I, I certainly will uh, pass that along, Pat. Yeah, please do. Um, it was just amazing. Um, well, my friend, we are coming up at 841. Okay. Yep. I think it is so, time. As to... always, we have good discussions, and it's been wonderful. Yeah.